Hi everyone, this is Hannah from Zook, one of the UK's fastest growing new job boards. Today I'm joined with Keith Wynas, who is the CEO uh, from Individual Strategies Limited, a management consultancy company based in Neston near Chester. Thank you very much for joining me, Keith. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning. Good morning. It's safe to say that you've had a very successful career and you've worked for some big companies such as the British Airways, Radisson and the Olympic Club. You've also worked in the football industry where you have been the CEO to three professional football clubs, including Aston Villa, Everton and Aberdeen, which is fantastic. So given your success over the years, I would like to ask you a few questions based around your career and what advice you'll be able to give job seekers uh, for them in their career development and their job search. So Keith, could you tell me how you started out in your chosen field? Well, it's uh, an interesting point. I think there's a bit of a thread of what I would call serendipity that runs through my whole career. I'd had a, a very uh, interesting experience in my second year at university when I traveled in the summer between the second and the third year and traveled across the States uh, for three months. And that gave me a bit of a, a wanderlust. And so when I decided as to which career I was gonna try and go after, uh, I decided to go and join British Airways on their graduate scheme, which gave me the chance to keep on traveling and to be part of an international, uh, you know, part of the international scene of travel, which was very alluring at the time for a young guy. Sales and marketing has been my theme in my whole career, uh, really my strength in many areas. And I've gone into not only the, uh, the leisure industry initially, but then transitioned from leisure into sport. I think what's been interesting is that I've had a very strong business background before I entered football and sport. And that's helped a lot in terms of uh, the way that we've been able to approach some of the problems I encountered in football. And what would you say has been your biggest challenge throughout your career? I don't think there's been any particular challenges other than the normal day-to-day -day business. I mean, the, I always laugh about, particularly in football, is that you can write a three-year business plan and then it all goes out the window after an 88th minute deflected free kick. <laughs> so it isn't so much a challenge as it's a way of thinking that you have to be aware of whatever gets thrown at you uh, and you have to be able to handle those sort of uh, fast balls and being able to handle any crisis situation. I can imagine right now in the, uh, the present situation with COVID, how many chief executives are now having to face that fast ball and have had their three-year business plan thrown out the window by a deflected virus. It's being, having that mindset, I think, to encounter challenge is the key thing. And um, what would you say has been your proudest achievement? From starting as a young guy, on the marketing of the Concord, I mean, it was fantastic to be uh, young in my 20s, be able to work on such a prestigious uh, product as the Concord. And then to go off and uh, work with my two partners to develop a, uh, a cruise line to actually, from a drawing on a napkin in a pub, to uh, actually raising the money and building it and launching it was uh, very satisfying to do that. But also then to go on with the Olympics in Sydney, which were absolutely superb to be part of that for five years beforehand. And then in football, it's just been you know, very satisfying to be part of uh, success. There are highs and lows every week with football. But nevertheless, when you achieve things, then uh, it's very gratifying. And as they say in football, every, every weekend is, is a shareholders meeting. And so you, you know whether you're doing well or not from the fan reaction. If you could start all over again, would you do anything differently? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, as I say right at the start, serendipity has been a bit of a thing where I've tended to make myself available. I've, I've always used the phrase, it's better to be on the pitch of life rather than in the stands. And so if you're on the pitch, then things can happen. And uh, I think you've got to accept to, to go with the, uh, the way that life sets you up and uh, you've got to take advantage of things. Have you experienced any failures throughout your career? We were trying to buy Cunard Cruise Lines at one time and we'd raised a significant amount of money with an investment bank in America and we were beaten in the last five minutes of the bidding, and that was after three years of hard work. So that felt like a failure, but in, uh, with hindsight, it was a great learning curve in terms of uh, how we would have been able to avoid that final result. Other failures, I mean, I'd, I'd never think of anything as a failure because often they are due to circumstances out of your control. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've got to do is, if you can change things, then those are the things you should be worried about. 
And if you can't change them, then you've got to do your best to learn from them and see what you could have done you know, differently in the, in the future. What is the best investment that you have made during your career? Uh, I think like many millions of people in the world, I would say it's my iPhone. Uh, I think that's what the, has been the biggest change for me in terms of accessibility, being able to react quickly, uh, to keep in touch. And the ability of the iPhone now has changed my life completely when I look back on it. What inspires you or motivates you to get up every morning? Most of the things I've been involved in are either startups or turnarounds. And so that's what motivates me is certainly starting up things and creating. I've always been uh, attracted to trying to create employment and particularly with the cruise line. It was one area that my partners and I were very keen to do because shipbuilding was one of the last labor intensive industries. And so we knew that we were going to put bread on a lot of tables by creating that project. Also, the creative uh, idea and being able to try and find a solution to issues that people haven't done or identifying gaps in market that people haven't done still motivates me and uh, makes me uh, very competitive to try and uh, to win. Great. What would you say is your greatest fear? I think, like uh, many people, I think that... that the fear is always your health in many ways now and that's been brought into a very sharp focus it's it's the fear of not being able to do things that you want to do uh it's often an irrational fear of um a failure in some way that everybody does have i think um but with experience comes the reality that uh, you're never going to succeed all the time so you, you carry on and i think experience starts to uh to give you those lessons that uh, not to be frightened of things and actually as you get older you become more fearless I think. What is the one thing that you find to be true that most other people would disagree with? Understanding the media and what they're really saying is one area that and, and politicians I think I always read between the lines in very different ways than many people. I'm a very much a contrarian in terms of business cycles as well so I tend to not follow the herd. And if you say that the majority of people would be the herd, then I tend to be the one that's uh, walking against the trend. What are your hobbies and interests outside of work? Uh, I've just completed writing a book, which has been uh, great fun to do that. And during the lockdown, I've been able to try and put some photographs into the, uh, the book and trying to get all that organized. So that's been great fun. What charities do you support and why? well, in Aberdeen, Everton and Aston Villa, where I've been actually able to resurrect what were failing community programmes. But those organisations cover a multitude of uh, charitable work. And so being able to put in place the power of football to utilise that tool to then work across very diff many different charities, I've been really, really pleased. And that's been a major part of something I've always wanted to achieve within, within the clubs I've worked in. How would you avoid burnout? I don't think you have to avoid burnout. I think you should em just embrace it. I don't think there's any prescription. I don't think you should be frightened of it. I don't think you should be frightened of having work present in your life um, that much. If, you, if it, you're doing something you love, then it's actually a sense of support in many ways. Optimism or pessimism? Which is better for business? Well, I think there's probably a third ism, apart from optimism and pessimism, I think there's called pragmatism. And I think that's where I would uh, be trying to, to work rather than either one. Uh, it is certainly dangerous to be optimistic. I think everybody finds that in their youth, they're genuinely more optimistic. And as you get older, you do become not so much pessimistic, but I think more you know, pragmatism becomes more to the fore. There is definitely a need to be realistic. And I think that's what experience gives you is an understanding of what is potentially real. What is your opinion on the saying, work smarter, not harder? If you've got the combination of both, then you're gonna be an absolute winner all the way through. Yeah. Uh, nothing wrong with hard work. Everything I've done that uh, has always required hard work has been great, but I like to think I work smart as well. So if you are working hard and working smart at the same time, then you're gonna go right to the top. So what would you say makes a good fit for your industry? certainly somebody that is inquiring and will not accept the norm as the answer they have to be the ones that come up with the what ifs and uh, to look at solutions in a different way not to just accept what we find on the internet about certain projects and certain ideas 
and not to accept what's always happened in the past as the way it will always be in the future. I think, given the present situation, that's going to become more and more important. But certainly, that's what I'm looking for, is people with the ability to think for themselves. What would you look for when you hire someone? I think you know it's very important these days that people do have a sense of self, that they have a strong personality, that they have a strong desire to succeed, that they have their own personal life in whatever shape or form that is, but they feel like they've got their own identity and that they uh, can contribute as an individual. And in every major career I've been in, uh, my number two has always gone on to replace me, which I'm very proud about. And so I want good people that uh, are better than me, if possible. What are the three things that you pay attention to while conducting an interview? They say in, in romance, you know, if you're going to like somebody in the first 10 seconds. Well, I think it's pretty much the same for me in those sort of interviews. I, that first impression is so important to me about how I'm going to handle that person as an individual and what I think of them uh, in terms of, uh, of who they are. What tips would you give someone when they're attending an interview? Successful interviewers have always done, in, in, with me anyway, is that the ones that have prepared and when you know, we get to the stage of the interview when we do ask some questions, that they, are, they ask sensible, really clever questions, trying to show that they have an, an understanding of my business and where we're trying to go and that they're showing they're already thinking about the future. In an actual an interview, many, many will be at the same level of qualification and many will be at the same level of experience. So what's going to push you ahead is that one or two percent, that marginal difference of how much you've thought about the business in, in general. And so it is a small marginal difference in many cases. And that's where the hard work and the effort and the creativity comes in to try and present yourself in that way. Yeah. I'd like to ask, what short and long term changes do you envisage as a result of the coronavirus pandemic? I think we're going to see a massive reduction in consumption. I think people are going to be looking to become resilient themselves. And where people were sort of dismissive of having that rainy day fund, I think everybody's going to make that their priority uh, going forward. I think there'll be a reluctance to be in mass population settings. And so that will impact things like football. And uh, I think that's going to be a major reorganization of how those arts uh, and sports areas are going to be actually working going forward. One of the things I'm involved very heavily in and have been for some years now is esports. Now, that's the other flip of the side of the coin where esports have gone through the roof in terms of um, the ability now. So, for every negative, there will be a positive. How do you think that the coronavirus will affect the job market in the short to medium term and also the long term? What we're going to see is a, a reallocation of resources. Uh, it was almost an example straight away when you saw the hospitality workers that were laid off all applying for jobs at the supermarkets because there was suddenly you know a need for, for jobs in those areas. Those that will succeed are be the ones right now job seeking that will be looking for industries that will now be successful in the new potential economy going forward. What are your thoughts on how to keep people motivated long term if they're remote working? I think one of the things you've got to keep motivated on, if you have an existing job and you're not happy with it, then of course it's hard to keep motivated, but everybody needs to do it still to keep the money coming in. I understand that. Uh, but maybe you need to do, the, you, know, you need to develop what they call your side hustle and you need to start thinking about, you know, what would you want to create? What would be your first internet company that you can see a gap in the market for? And uh, start to keep yourself focused that way. And that helps you read and learn more about business in general and will eventually give you perhaps better tools to do the job that you're actually in at the moment. How has the coronavirus affected hiring and candidate demand in your industry? In one section, we've actually hired another 30 people um, in the last two weeks um, with the growth that we've had in the esports area. Certainly on the football side, it's um, while there's still interest in buying and selling of football clubs and, uh, and clubs wanting to try and find ways to improve revenue streams they're going to be facing some very tough times and a huge readjustment uh, in football as it goes forward there are going to be winners and losers in this new readjustment but it's by no means all gloom there are many growth spots in the economy and there will be i think coming forward 
what do you think will happen to the football industry, especially the Premier League post coronavirus? If I go back to my first days when I entered football back in about 2000, I was being told about a thing called the prune juice effect. And that was how all the money that came into a football club went through the club's pockets and into the players' car park with all the Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And it was called the prune juice effect. The money just went right through the club. I think there's going to be a big readjustment because there isn't going to be as much money going in at the top end. And the broadcasters will lose a lot of sponsors from the different companies that will be affected. So therefore, they can't pay the amount of money that has been driving football so far in the Premier League in general. And I think that will be reflected globally. So if you take it that there will be a big adjustment in the broadcast income for football clubs in the Premier League, then it goes the prune juice effect can't trickle down as well to the football players. So the values also of transfer fees and different things that have been going on for the last few years, as many have said, have been uh, ridiculous in their, in their levels, will be adjusted dramatically. What will be important more, and more than ever is for football to produce its own young talent and those with good academies will, will do well. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and opinions. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Okay, Hannah. Thank you.